I'm going to be talking about thinking, about the direct, explicit teaching of thinking, so that thinking becomes a curriculum subject which we can treat as seriously as we treat any other subject. But what is thinking all about? Let's imagine a triangle, and at the top of that triangle, we're going to put values. Then at one of the base angles, we're going to put health. And the other base angle, we put thinking. The purpose of thinking, be the purpose of life, is to enjoy and deliver our values. Whatever those values might be, to do enjoy and deliver the values. They may be spiritual values, material values, family values. The purpose of life is to enjoy and deliver those values to ourselves and to others. Health is the base. Health supports our ability to enjoy and deliver our values. Thinking is the mechanism by which we enjoy or deliver those values. So thinking is important. Now let's look at another triangle. And another triangle. At the top, we have constructive thinking. Constructive thinking is how we build things, how we improve things, how we make things happen. Bottom angle, we have critical thinking. The use of judgment stops us doing things which are bad, illegal, polluting, don't work, unfair, and so on. Then at this base, we have creative thinking. All those are aspects of thinking. On the whole, we're not too bad at critical thinking, but we're not so good at the other two. Now let's imagine we have three people. Three people go off to buy a car. The first person has a lot of money. The second person has a big family. The third person has very little money. The first person buys a very nice sports car. Very powerful, very nice sports car. The second person with a big family has to buy a minibus. Third person without much money buys a small hatchback. Now the question I would ask is, which of those three people is the best driver? Which of those three people is the best driver? And the answer is, of course, you can't tell. Having money doesn't make you a big driver. Having needs for a certain type of car doesn't make you a good driver, and so on. In other words, the car that is bought is separate from the skill of driving. Now, if we look at thinking and intelligence, we get a similar situation. We imagine a car. The horsepower of the car, the suspension, the engineering, all that is the potential of the car. Just as intelligence is the potential of the mind, determined possibly by the speed of transmission along the neurons. But the way the car performs does not only depend on the skill of the driver, or depend on the power of the engine. Performance of a car does not only depend on the power of the engine, it depends also on the skill of the driver, the skill with which that driver manages the potential of the car. In the same way, intelligence is a potential, thinking is a skill, the skill with which we use that potential. That is why it is so essential to teach thinking at both ends of the spectrum. At one end, at the high IQ end, if you don't teach thinking, you risk wasting that high intelligence. At the lower end of the spectrum of intelligence, you need to teach thinking in order to make the best use of the available intelligence. And of course, it applies all the way in between. That is why the direct explicit teaching of thinking is so very important in school and for later life. Now when we're looking at thinking, traditionally, 
we've looked at one particular aspect of thinking. If we divide thinking into two parts, there is processing and there is perception. Now, under processing, we've developed truly excellent systems of mathematics, statistics, computers and data processing, and various forms of logic. These are excellent processing systems. And over the years, we've improved them all the time, and as they get better and better processing systems. But before we can process, it is perception which provides the ingredients for processing. It's rather as if you were in the kitchen and all the food was put on a table in a corner of the kitchen and all you were asked to do was to cook it to process it. And you could do that and you'd have an output. Then one day you say, yes, that's fine, but where do the ingredients come from? Who chose them? Who brought them here? How are they grown? Now, the role of perception is to look at the world, to interact with the world, and provide the ingredients for processing. Now, traditionally, we put most of the emphasis in teaching on processing for a number of reasons. We have believed that if your processing is correct, the answer will be correct. Unfortunately, not so. If the perception is faulty, the output will be faulty. We now know also that most of the mistakes in thinking, something like 80 to 90% of the mistakes in thinking are mistakes of perception. Mistakes of processing are quite rare outside highly technical subjects. Mistakes of perception are abundant. Professor David Perkins at Harvard University did research on this and showed exactly that. 80 to 90% of the mistakes of thinking were mistakes of perception. But all the emphasis we put traditionally has been on processing. And we are very good at that. Let me give you one very simple example of the difference between perception and processing. The story is of a little boy called Johnny. And he's five years old. And one day, his friends offer him a choice of two coins, a $1 coin and a $2 coin. And they say to him, Johnny, which of these do you want? You can take, you can keep, whichever one you choose. Johnny, being very young, reckons the bigger one must surely be better, and so he takes the bigger one. His friends laugh and giggle and say, isn't Johnny stupid? He doesn't realize the smaller one is worth twice as much as the bigger one. So whenever they want to tease him, they offer him the coins, always takes the bigger one, never seems to learn. One day there's an adult who's watching this, feels sorry for Johnny, calls him over, says, Johnny, believe me when I tell you the smaller one is actually worth twice as much as the bigger one, even though it is smaller. Johnny listens very politely, and then he says, yes, he says, I know that, but how many times would they have offered it to me if I had taken the $2 the first time? Now, the point of that story is exactly that, that if you had a computer programmed for value, the computer would have had to take the $2 the first time. It's Johnny's human perception. Johnny's human perception which allowed him to take a bigger view of the future and the possibility of repeat business. In other words, instead of one $2 coin, coins, the possibility of several $1 coins. Now that's a very complicated perception. He had to know how often he would meet his friends, how long they'd want to go on teasing him, how long they'd want to go on losing $1, how long before they suspected what he was up to, and, of course, the risk factor. Now, once you've perceived all that, you can indeed try and put it in an expert system in a computer. But you have to perceive it first. Perception is a key part of thinking, the part of thinking which, by and large, we have always neglected. 
because we felt that logic and processing were enough. Let me give you another illustration of what I mean. We have some pieces here, and the task is to put these pieces together to give a nice, simple, coherent shape. So we can play around with those pieces and try and put them together. The purpose of education is really to show us how to put those pieces together. So now I'm going to try and put those pieces together. and we get our rectangle. Well, that's fine, and we've learned how to put those pieces together, and on any occasion we can put the pieces together. But the key question is, where do the pieces come from? It's one thing in school, you're sitting there, and you've got your textbook or the teacher, and the teacher says, these are the pieces, these are the pieces of the problem or situation, put them together. But in real life, that doesn't happen. In real life, it is your perception which looks at the world and decides which are the pieces. What do they look like? You have to decide the pieces, and then you have to put them together. They aren't laid out in front of you.